Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this Talking Hemophilia A, Integrating Novel Treatments and Enhancing Patient Outcomes. During this segment, we'll be discussing the current approaches to management of hemophilia A. I'm Dr. Mindy Simpson. I'm the medical director of the Rush Hemophilia and Thrombophilia Center at Rush University Medical Center. I am joined by my colleagues, Dr. Jonathan Roberts and Dr. Guy Young. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, just as a really basic background, of course, setting the stage. So hemophilia A is, of course, factor eight deficiency. Um, it affects about one in five to 10,000. And it is, of course, X-linked recessive. The severity of hemophilia is defined by factor eight activity levels, where severe is less than 1%, moderate is 1% to 5%, and mild is 6 to 40%. And the classic bleeding, of course, is the recurrent musculoskeletal bleeding. And really, our goals of therapy is to prevent bleeding. And um, if we do our jobs well, we can try to do that for our patients. Treatment for hemophilia has evolved over many decades now. And if we think about kind of the timelines of the treatment options that have come through, I really think about kind of, you know, back in the 40s and 50s where we really didn't have much to offer patients other than maybe plasma. So really this was an area of supportive care. We then kind of moved into the replacement era with the um, identification of cryoprecipitate mm -hmm. and being able to concentrate factors and really moved into this area where we can treat patients, treat effectively bleeding, and then eventually into prevention of bleeding and prophylaxis. Now, that has covered for the better part of the last 50 years, and we are very fortunate to be in a time where we have growing numbers of options, where patients can really choose therapies based on, um, you know, what is going on with their life and, you know, really personalizing treatment and individualizing their, their therapy. Um, we have moved into kind of, you know, the idea of replacement factors, extended half-life products, and now into novel therapies and even gene therapy, which we'll talk about um, over the next couple segments. Prophylaxis has been really the standard of care in prevention of bleeding for patients since probably the 1990s. Um, and that is, you know, the idea of treating on a scheduled basis to prevent bleeding. Um, and we know through recurrent studies that have been done that if you take prophylaxis, it can be effective. Prophylaxis only works if you take it. And so, you know, our biggest challenge is really the adherence to the treatment options where a lot of the newer therapies and where the, the treatment options are going are helping us to really tailor our prophylaxis options for individual patients, what their lifestyles are, what their bleeding phenotypes are, and, and really working with them for choices. The We know that there is a lot of barriers to being adherent to therapy. Um, some of our options of therapy still require frequent IV infusions. Newer therapies may offer less frequent infusions, subcutaneous mm -hmm. options, um, some infrequent subcutaneous options, and then maybe even things like gene therapy with um, you know, potential for a one-time treatment. The studies have shown that really adherence can be highly variable. Um, as we know, 50% or so less than patients tend to be completely adherent to the prescribed therapy. Um, some studies have shown even up to 80% of patients can be non-adherent to their prescribed therapy. And it's important to recognize the, the various barriers that come with that. There are barriers based on the different patients, how old they are, what their other comorbidities may be, what they foresee their hemophilia um, being as part of their their life, you know what the treatments are, whether they have you know access to care, insurance barriers, um, you know problems getting factor or these other therapies, um, and then there's numerous socioeconomic barriers that that come into play. So really working with each of our patients and finding something that's going to work for them um, is is ultimately the goal, I think, for, for how best to manage them. So I have just a couple cases, then I'm gonna bank off of my colleagues here to see how maybe we can approach different different ideas. The first case I have is a baby approaching, um, you know, an age of, of starting more therapy. And then the other one is kind of the young, a young adult where we have, um, you know, very much different challenges. 
So the first case I have is a six month old, severe hemophilia A, was diagnosed at birth due to family history um, and has been coming for regular appointments in the last six months, typically brought by maternal grandmother who is very knowledgeable in hemophilia because she has numerous family members that have been affected. Her daughter, um, of course, is a carrier, and um, I have only seen her a few times in clinic um, because of work schedules and other um, other things in, in life. And so, you know, have had less time to really talk to her about bleed recognition and management of hemophilia and options and things along those lines. So at the age of five months, this baby presented to the emergency room with an ankle hemarthrosis, um, got admitted. That was the first time they had received factor. So now just thinking about, you know, what do we do? What are our options? Um, you know, should we be thinking of prophylaxis now? Should we have thought about it before? Um, and um, any, any, anybody with kind of some thoughts on, on what to do and, um, you know, if I most of my education's been with with grandma, um, but she's not the official medical decision maker, so she's not the the person that carries the insurance. So, um, you know, any 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 thoughts from my colleagues on kind of you know what we should be thinking of? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I think having a first hemarthrosis, I definitely um, would have the conversation, especially at that age, you know, to initiate. Um, prophylactic therapy. And I think really, you know, the options are, um, you know, are you going to try to commit this uh, this infant to regular factor infusions, or are you going to use an alternative option um, like emicizumab? Um, I think, you know, even, you know, seven years ago, our only option really would have been to do, uh, to do factor therapy. And now there's been more emerging data on use of emicizumab uh, in infants with the uh, Haven 7 trial coming out uh, recently. So, I mean, I think really access to infusions is going to be number one uh, difficulty in someone this age. So certainly a five-month-old, unless the family's very astute with venous access and infusing, uh, you know, really subcutaneous therapy with emicizumab would be um, kind of the easiest go-to prophylactic therapy, but should the patient actually be prophylaxed with the first hemarthrosis? I think definitely. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know the circumstances of how you know in, in detail that happened, but um, definitely that would be first on my list to talk with them after the acute treatment of this bleeding event is how to prevent any more uh, issues from happening. Yeah, I completely agree um, that at this age. Um, you know, subcutaneously administered drugs are a lot easier. And so emicizumab offers that option. It would be really challenging to start prophylaxis in such a young child. You certainly need a central venous catheter, uh, almost in all likelihood. Um, <clears throat> but then the question then would become about adding factor eight at some point. And because the issue with emicizumab is you're not giving any factor eight exposures. And historically, uh, we would identify patients with inhibitors early on after starting prophylaxis because they would quickly reach 20 exposure days, 50 exposure days, typically within a few months. And then you either know they have an inhibitor or they don't, but at least um, you know you know which path you're on. I, I fully endorse starting emicizumab in, in infants, but then the question becomes, do you also find a way to expose them to factor eight in some way, shape, or form um, so that you can get them to 20 or 50 exposure days in an effort to, I call it, unmask the inhibitor. I don't know that that would necessarily be tolerizing, so I'm careful not to call that tolerizing doses of factor eight. Um, so that, that really becomes a, a major question to ask, and, and you know, not at five months of age, but maybe at a year, year and a half, uh, once a week or every other week, uh, you know, factor eight infusions. And this is something that really warrants some study. And, and, and there's a study underway that's trying to answer that question. So that's the, you know, it's not as simple as, hey, let's just start emicizumab and, you know, we'll check you every six months or every year and you're going to be fine. There are other issues that come up if you do that. Yeah, so I totally agree, and I, I've had this similar conversation. I think I started talking about the option of emicizumab really early on. Um, you know, the the most recent MASAC guidelines from the National Hemophilia Foundation really support the, at least the conversation about starting early, um, you know, even within the first six months, potentially, to reduce the risk of things like intracranial hemorrhage. Um, 
But, um, you know, now I think when we're in the realm of discussing with family, um, I too will probably pursue most likely the emesizumab route. That's the, by far the easiest option, but patients do have choices. So we'll discuss it all, but, um, but I agree. And I think it was really important to see this first joint bleed early is unusual. Um, mom, the only risk they thought was, you know, maybe getting dressed, she twisted the ankle, um, which, you know, if if that's all it takes, then I do worry that this kid is going to have more um, when they start being much more mobile. So, um, so yeah. yeah, definitely something I think that prompts starting early. Really, we're working on getting the family in, working on education of you know the parents, um, and trying to get everybody on board. So, um, right, and I, think, and I think also just you know making sure that they understand moving forward the need to. Um, eventually be able to treat an acute bleeding event that 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 alone for prophylaxis doesn't treat uh, an acute bleeding event per se so still the act venous access issue may be a complication you know moving forward so yeah absolutely and I, I think um you know first really applauding them for recognizing joint bleeding um early when this yeah. kid had no other bleeding um you know I think that probably did benefit having family history and grandma was in the house and recognized it. So, um, you know, applauding that and really talking about, you know, bleed management. And I think that is something on emesizumab that we really need to keep harping on is treating bleeding, having access to factor, still learning infusions and those types of things. Um, the other case that I have is is total opposite end of the spectrum. So this is a 25-year-old male with hemophilia A, severe. He had a longstanding history of a high titer inhibitor when he was younger that ultimately was tolerized. Um, and he has remained um, uh, with, with a good response to factor eight now for many years. Um, but during his time with, a, with an inhibitor, he had numerous complications. He had intracranial hemorrhage. He had several um, rounds of compartment syndrome. He's had at least two fasciotomies um, and really has seen some of the worst of, of what I consider with hemophilia. He continues to have recurrent joint bleeding. Um, now he has, um, he actually ended up with an AV fistula for venous access during his time many years ago that remains really good venous access for him. So for him, that mm -hmm. is not a barrier. Um, but yet for the last at least five to 10 years, he has had complications of non-adherence, back and forth on and off of insurance, um, you know, really not treating. Um, and so continues to come into the hospital several times a year with fairly major joint bleeds. He has numerous, um, you know, it, uh, numerous joints that are affected by hemophilic arthropathy. Um, and so, you know, really talking to him now about, you know, I, I think being on prophylaxis is an obvious need for him. Um, He's now, you know, a father of two children, young children, toddlers. Um, he now has insurance, but he still doesn't really treat very well. Um, so he has totally different needs and different barriers. Um, and, you know, what are what are approaches that, that you guys have, you know, taken with kind of these more complicated patients? You know, I think the main question is for patients who are tolerized for this long, you know, what is the concern about recurrence of an inhibitor if you come off factor eight? Now, in some respects, he's already uh, tested that, <laughs> you know, by being on adherent, he's not like actually getting regular factor eight. So with that, I would feel fairly confident that, um, you know, you could approach it with a non-factor eight therapy. We've discussed emesizumab and there'll be others available as well. Um, and then for an adult patient, um, you know, I'm not sure how things will shake out with the approval of gene therapy drugs because the current trials uh, um, prevent or, or exclude patients with a history of inhibitors. But, you know, I don't know that necessarily this patient would be a bad um, uh, subject or, or I should say uh, a patient who, who wouldn't potentially benefit from that. But I think some of it will depend on you know, how, how the FDA decides on, on packaging these or, or putting the package, uh, the prescribing information in there. So I know there's just a minute left. Let's let Jonathan chime in on this case too. Yeah, no, I mean, I think uh, like, like you said, it is a challenge to try to also find the individual um, kind of conceptual barriers that he has um, to treatment and some of the access issues and maybe the, the home environment and what his history has been 
you know, with, with hemophilia. And I think, um, you know, all those things are important to take into consideration when choosing, you know, what is the right, um, the right therapy. Um, maybe there's, you know, a misunderstanding is, you know, to if he wants one therapy over another, but I think, um, uh, yeah, trying to, to meet his needs and, and figure out how you can improve access to care really is a testament to why, you know, we have multidisciplinary teams um, at treatment centers to really um, get to the nuance of how we can best uh, treat patients and help them meet their goals. Yeah, so I totally agree. And I think we've been trying to find some motivating factor that will get him kind of to consider the idea that he can do better. And I, I worry sometimes that patients like this are so ingrained and I have hemophilia, I'm supposed to feel like this, I'm supposed to have bleeding and really trying to get him around the idea that these newer therapies can offer him a different quality of life. So um, so he's, he's still he's a bit of a work in progress. Um, I will say we've talked a lot about the newer therapies. We talked a lot about the risk of inhibitor coming back and the concern for that. But I said that I actually told him that I think he's done the, the biggest challenge of being non-adherent um, with factor. It's probably far worse than putting him on um, a potential newer agent. <laughs> that, um, you know, the, the recurrent bleeding is probably his biggest challenge. So, um, so, it, you know, I agree. I have rallied the psychosocial component of our team and the nurses and everybody. And, uh, he is a, he is a team approach for sure. So, um, well, I think I, we've run out of time for this segment, so I am going to thank everybody for joining us um, on this segment of the current approaches of management of hemophilia A. Uh, please be sure to click on the landing page for this activity to claim your AMA, ANCC, or ACPE credit um, to access supplemental slides as well as other topic segments and case scenarios. Thank you.